Representative Figueroa, thank you so much for talking to us on this Ash Wednesday. You are sponsoring some measures that attempt to professionalize government in a few different ways. One of them, modernizing the legislature. What's the goal here? The end goal in several of the modernization measures is to make us more efficient and more inclusive and allow us to do the work that the people of New Mexico need us to do. And you're not doing that now? <laughs> we are attempting to do that now in the framework that we have, but adjustments can be made to make it more efficient. And these are things we have not looked at in many, many years. The length of the session, for example, has not been changed since the 1960s. And if you think about how different the world is, Medicare hadn't been invented. Um, our whole health system in terms of science and distribution and affordability has drastically changed even in the last 20 years, much less compared to 1960. So the complexity of the issues we are debating and making policy about demand more time. Are we talking full time or? Well, House, Bill, House Joint Resolution 2 proposes that we extend the session to be instead of 60 and then the next year 30 days, that it is 60 days each year. So we have that additional 30 days to debate and to deliberate. Does that mean that in uh, even numbered years you would only be looking at the budget for 60 days? No, it would mean in that even numbered year it would be open and not limited to the budget. So, you know, I think people say sometimes spending more time on this isn't going to make this any better. What, why do we need uh, more time in the session? I mean, can't you get it done in 30 days every other year? Well, <clears throat> there are arguments pro and con, but I would, I would posit that time is one of the parameters that limit the thoughtfulness of our debate and the depth of our research and our ability to hear from our constituents because we have so little turnaround time, we need to know what they want from us. And 60 days gives them a broader window to read the bills and to give us feedback. So there's another measure that would um, go to the voters, ask them to approve a commission to set salaries for lawmakers. We've been talking about this for a long time, right? So why do we need to pay lawmakers? Why do you think so? Well, every time I have a town hall, at least one of my constituents says, when are we going to pay our legislators? They see it as a way for us to be more accountable to them. If we're paid, they can ask more of us. And that's reasonable. They know right now we're volunteers. They know that between nine to five, there are some of us they can't reach for 10 months of the year. And they want us more accessible to them. Um, and they want us to be able to do a better job. The other piece that might actually be just as important, if not more, is that if we're paid, we can include more voices. There are whole swaths of people, working class people, who can't consider running for the legislature. Their voices are not heard here because there is no salary here. And if we want to bring those voices in, we have to find a way to pay a salary. Now the third measure that we're looking at has to do with school boards and campaign finance. What do you want to do? Uh, the, shine a light on school board practices. Uh, most of our school boards across this state, and there are 80, 89 of them, are doing fabulous, amazing work. But there are a couple issues we could tweak. One, for example, is campaign contributions. As, as the world of money in politics has changed, we need to illuminate even more. Um, where the money comes from. And right now, only four school districts in the state are large enough. Actually, Santa Fe just shrank in enrollment. So only three are large enough to meet the criteria that requires campaign finance reports. There's an exclusion that says if your district is smaller than 12,000, you don't have to report. So we want to eliminate that because every New Mexican deserves to see where money is coming from in their candidates' campaigns. Senator Schmadis, thank you so much for talking to us today. Oh, you're welcome, Gwyneth. You are facing some heavy opposition to some uh, good government bills that you are supporting this session. One of them would um, open the primaries. And this is different from some other proposals we've seen. How does yours work? Well, mine creates a fully open primary. So regardless of your political registration status, you get to show up and they say, 
what ballot do you want? Do you want a Republican primary? Do you want a Democrat primary? Here you go. Your registration status really doesn't matter. Now, we have heard opposition saying, you know, people need to get involved with the party. They have mm -hmm. to show that they are devoted, mm -hmm. that they are involved. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that? Well, I say these are the people that have created this monopoly or duopoly in American politics, right? So, so a lot of people in the middle feel boxed out. They feel disenfranchised and disillusioned from our are just two-party form of, of government, right? And so th they say hop on board with our way of doing things, and that's not what people want to do. So, you know, for example, this would allow Democrats to vote in your primary election. Are you worried about them coming in and voting for a candidate who's much more liberal than you? No, not at all. Um, you know, I, I don't have that worry. I think it uh, has the potential to even moderate things. Um, and I, I don't see a, a widespread, you know, concerted effort to do those things. If someone really wants to give up their opportunity to vote in a Democrat primary in, to vote Republican, well, let them do that. You're also um, asking to see more information from lobbyists mm -hmm. about what they're up to. What do you want to do? Uh, well, we have two bills to just blow the door wide open in politics here. It would be amazing. Um, so the first bill would require lobbyists to disclose which specific piece of legislation they're lobbying for or against. The second bill would also require them not only to disclose that information, but how much money they're being paid to either push a certain bill or to kill a piece of legislation. Now, I'm sure some of the you know, uh, opposition to this is that it's too complicated. It's too difficult to figure out, it, you know, to, to report that. It, does it have to be in real time? Um, it would have to be before the close of the session. Um, and and it's, it's not difficult. The Secretary of State's office already has all this software to track all of our financial things and all those matters. So it's really not too much of a lift, I don't think. Wouldn't this just allow you to say, oh, I see what, um, you know, what uh, the, this and such, the oil and gas lobby is lobbying for? I'm just going to say yes, 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 right down the list. It would help legislators know where the special interest is. Is it out of state? Is it in state? Which industries are pushing it? Which industries are against it? And it would allow the public to know. I mean, it, it would be great, I think. Senator O'Neill, thank you so much for talking to us today. My pleasure, Gwyneth. You have been a supporter of open primaries for at, at least a decade. Yes. Right? You have a bill that would open primaries up a little bit, um, and it passed the Senate. Now it goes to the House. What is your prognostication? Okay. Even though we had this amazing vote in the Senate, 28 to 10, bipartisan, just a very interesting uh, uh, who was with who and who was against with who, you know. Um, the, the House ha historically, recently, just not really liked this bill very much. So we have a real challenge to get it through the House. But I'm very proud of the fact that we got it through the Senate. I had people texting me uh, saying congratulations, this is historic, and so forth. So I think the time has come. Look, the deal is, what are we afraid of? The people will actually vote? Oh my God, gee whiz. You know, honestly, everybody knows that DTS voters and younger folks, they don't get out of college and go, I am a Republican, oh, I am a Democrat. No, they tend to avoid that label and they register as independents, not just younger people. I'm, I'm told that um, army veterans, uh, veterans are, are like 50% of them are independents. I mean, it, how many people do you know that are independents and then shut out of our primaries? And in these days of quite uh, extreme, well, lack of competitive districts, the primary is even more important than it is, has been. So these folks are engaged, they want to participate, so my bill is simply acknowledging and respecting their affiliation as independents so they can walk into a polling place and vote for a Republican or a Democrat, and, and incredibly, the world's not going to end.